Welcome into K-State Online. I am Mason Voth, joined by Drew Galloway here on this Friday to talk a little basketball because everybody was gifted the non-conference basketball schedule today for K-State, so you can start to make your plans as you see fit, uh, if you see fit for the non-conference, because you're going to really have to love basketball and watching the Cats and probably have a semi-sane drive, or you say, hey, I've got young kids. I can't waste money on a big ticket game because they might ruin my day, but I can drop a, a couple of bucks to go see a buy game against a nobody because it's a light schedule. And I, I'll say this, Drew, because there are going to be people that want to take shots at Jerome Tang and K-State for how they scheduled this year. Um, I think some of those would maybe be valid. It is a very, very soft schedule for K-State. But there's also an element to this where they have two fewer non-conference games than they had in past years because of the Big 12 playing 20 conference games this season, which you and I, we talked to Gene Taylor at Big 12 Media Day, and he kind of hinted at the fact that, hey, that might get chopped down or that's at least something the coaches want to revisit. But when you add those two extra conference games against what are going to be quad one opponents, basically every game you play in the Big 12 is going to be a quad one game, then it takes away from the non-con because it would kind of be silly to do that. I understand that argument. You also are hamstrung by the fact that the Wichita State game is on here. You scheduled that for four years before Jerome Tang even got here, and Wichita State has managed to get worse over the four years uh, as that schedule has gone on, and we'll see maybe Paul Mills has that in a better direction this year, but they should still not be something that beats this version of K-State as we know the roster to be. So uh, that's kind of the initial overarching thoughts about the schedule. K-State will open up the season at home on November 5th against New Orleans. Uh, they'll play their first four games of the season in Manhattan. So you'll, ha you'll have four games in a two-week stretch, and then the Cats will head off for their Thanksgiving tournament, the Paradise Jam, and the Virgin Islands. And that is a whole nother beast to this non-conference schedule that suggests it's not going to be a very good non-con because K-State is not in a marquee Thanksgiving tournament. Like It's been a while since we've seen K-State in a situation like that, and they are going to one of these tournaments where you're not going to have that stout of competition. If you go and look at who's in it, K-State's going to play George Washington in the first game. Then they would play either Louisiana and Liberty, and you're probably going to have to get to the championship game, which K-State should. If they don't, that's already a colossal failure to play likely McNeese State, where you know obviously there was some revival that went on there uh, with Will Wade this past season. That's probably the second best team that's going to be uh, in that situation, or UAB, Andy Kennedy is their head coach. So it's it's pretty light. Like St. John's is going to do a lot of heavy lifting in this schedule. So I'll I'll give the floor to you now, Drew. What what do you make of this non-conference schedule for K-State? It, it's a good thing that the home conference slate is how it is because this home non-conference slate is rough. I mean, look, going off of last season, Mississippi Valley State, worst team in college basketball in Ken Palm. New Orleans, 342 of 362. Uh, and then Arkansas Pine Bluff, 331 out of 362. Like that, that was our three of the worst teams, three of the worst 30 teams in college basketball all coming to Manhattan. Cleveland State will be probably pretty solid. They've developed a pretty good basketball program. But that's not a team that should beat K-State. LSU, we've seen the last two years, has been kind of a, a disaster, and I, I don't see them getting any better. But we'll, that game will have some fire with Cam Carter coming back, so like that'll be kind of a fun, a fun atmosphere. Paradise Jam Field is like you kind of hit the nail on the head. It's pretty awful, to, to be honest. Uh, Arkansas Pine Bluff, horrible. St. John's is going to be pretty good. That will be the game that we really see – where K-State's at, because that's a team that could be top 15, top 20 uh, by the time that K-State goes to New York City and either plays at uh, Madison Square Garden or at St. John's. Uh, but that game 
and we kind of talked about this uh, before we started recording, is the same day as the, the Big 12 championship game for football. So that that kind of stinks from a, a perspective of like us uh, and even K-State fans that wanted to go to New York. Uh, Drake, who knows with a new coach, what they're going to look like. But the, the game in Kansas City always has a fun atmosphere. And I expect a pretty good crowd in the T-Mobile Center for that one because at least Drake has a pulse. And then Wichita State, again, who knows what they're going to end up looking like. You, you would like Wichita State to be good enough that that game could still be a quad one game, but I I think that that's going to end up being a quad two game. But overall, this schedule is just kind of what you get when you have 20 conference games and you play in the best league in America. But it'll be good for K-State to really kind of build up and ranch it up because they have so many new pieces that you would like to see them kind of ease into it a little bit. Yeah, that's then that's a fair point. But, you know, you do have a lot of these pieces. They've played college basketball before. You're expecting them to come in and be good. They should be able to handle a little bit more. Part of what this boils down to, and I know I know that Jerome Tang, as we lose Drew there, I know Jerome Tang has a method in which he wants to try and schedule the Thanksgiving tournaments. He said he always wants to go to the island, some kind of destination place. I do think in some ways K-State is going to have to change their mindset with that because, you know, you look around, what K-State did to schedule this year is not all that different from how Iowa State scheduled this season. Iowa State is going to play Mississippi Valley State to start the season. Then they'll play UMKC, not very good. They're going to play Uwe Pooey, one of the worst teams in college basketball. They're going to get Marquette in their Big 12 Big East battle game. They'll get Jackson State, another team from, you know, uh, one of the, the conferences in the South that just isn't very strong. And then Omaha and Morgan State. The other two notes on their schedule, and those are all home games, by the way, they only have two dates where they will be out of town. That's when they will play Iowa and then when they will play in the Maui Invitational. So the saving grace is they get to go to Maui this year. So that benefits them. Uh, it's going to be a stronger field. When it becomes K-State's turn to go back to Maui, they have to take it when they get that opportunity. But that's one of the things benefiting Iowa State this year. And then K-State's playing Wichita State, an in-state school. Uh, and Iowa State and, and Iowa are playing. It just so happens that Iowa State and Iowa aren't in the same conference. So they play out of conference. K-State's playing Wichita State, who at this time is not anywhere near where they've been in the past. So it's going to be interesting. It's going to be a little bit tricky uh, to kind of see how things get navigated as you know K-State gets through the schedule. But simply put, K-State should dominate this schedule. They should go through here, and they should win every single one of these games. Maybe the St. John's game you look at and say, okay, on the road, year two of Rick Patino. They also felt like they were on the bubble last year. Uh, so maybe you give them a little bit of a, a chance and say, that could happen, but I think K-State should be better than St. John's this season. I really do. So we'll see how that ends up playing out for K-State, but this is a light, light non-conference, and it isn't something uh, that you should feel overwhelmingly good about. But I'll, I'll, I'll bring Drew back in and see kind of what he thinks here. I was just saying this, this schedule for K-State is very similar to what Iowa State is doing this year. Just Iowa State has a couple of other built-in advantages that K-State doesn't because it's not their turn to go to Maui, although that should be coming in the very near future, and K-State should be working on that as hard as they can to get back in that mix. And then they have a better option in playing Iowa than K-State does in Wichita State. But everything else about their schedules are very comparable. Yeah, it, it is very Iowa State-y, and, and that, that's something that I think is kind of what everybody's kind of doing going forward. Like BYU kind of did the same thing last year where – they didn't really play anybody in the non-conference either. And I think that this is just kind of the the result of playing 20 conference games. Like, you don't want to exude, exude all of your energy in the non-conference and you want to hit that peak around the end of, or uh, the middle of conference play. So I understand it a little bit, but just from a perspective of wanting to play the best teams, I would like to see them even play upper level mid majors over what they have right now. But I know that if you do that, you risk the the fact the factor of just losing. But I, I don't know how much you really gain outside of 
just more experience in playing each other than you do with playing a team like Mississippi Valley State, who was one in 30 last season. Yeah. And, and I mean, you're also looking at this from the standpoint of like those upper level mid majors, they're starting to get a little bit more confident in the way that they feel about this stuff. And, you know, they're, they'll try and get like a two for one situation or they want more money out of you. It's more feasible in a lot of ways for K State to schedule and other teams to schedule like this. It's, it doesn't hurt their resume like you would think that maybe it would. And then in addition to that, like financially, it's going to save the athletic department a little bit more money. It's it's easier to pay New Orleans to come to Manhattan to kick their butt than it is, say, South Dakota State last year. You know, like South yeah. Dakota State, that is a game that K-State scheduled and it should be thought of as, you know, a little bit easier or whatever else uh, in terms of uh, how fans would perceive it. Like that's kind of what you're looking for. It just it doesn't benefit anybody at the end of the day, and uh, K State's kind of playing the game right here. It's going to feel gross. It's not going to be as fun to watch as a fan. Um, it might make you feel better about K State if they actually go out and beat the snot out of these teams this year, unlike they were able to do last year. So uh, yeah, I don't know. It's yeah. it, it's it's one of those I don't feel good about uh, w- like looking at on paper. Uh, but as long as K State gets through it. And I'm telling you, they have to get through it 10-1 and or 11-0 and uh, to feel yes. good. But then you have that grind of 20 Big 12 games in there, and it seems like it's going to be 20 consecutive games. There will be no time off, no, no bye weekends or whatever in Big 12 play this year. It's going to be a grind from the last week of December until you get to the NCAA tournament. Yeah, I was going to point that out too, that the one thing of this – schedule I think really does do is it puts pressure on you to bring it and you can't drop a game because this some of these games will be quad four losses if you were to drop them so you have to do what you can and beat the snot out of them because we've seen the the net really likes it when you beat the crap out of teams that you're supposed to beat the crap out of so you do that and then you hit the grind of big 12 where if you're if you're going to make the tournament with this schedule, you still probably just need to go ten and ten, eleven and nine in Big Twelve, and I think that you're pro- pretty comfortably in the NCAA tournament. So it sets you up really well, and you, you, it lets you pad the wins because sometimes in the right, wrong, or indifferent, the selection committee kind of looks at your overall win loss record. And it's like, ooh, like 18 and 13. Yeah, I don't know how, how I feel about that compared to somebody that's like 22 and 9, but probably has like less quality wins than the 18 and 13 team. Yeah, it, it, this the comparisons that will go on are, are going to be fascinating uh, now with the way that these schedules have been baked in. And there was a lot made about it by the ACC last year, kind of complaining about how it went. Uh, but what the ACC didn't do was, you know, win games then that they should have when they had these opportunities. Like, uh, I mean, Jeff Capel was one of the biggest complainers about uh, the net manipulation last year. It's like, dude, you lost to Missouri, so uh, and they and they also had a bottom thirty non-conference uh, schedule, yeah, by the net and still complained that teams were gaming the net when Pitt just didn't game the net correctly. Yeah, yeah, you did. You weren't trying to game the net. You just got bad teams, and and that's kind of the point too of of how this stuff ends up working out. Like in a in a normal way, and look, this some basketball is a lot different than football. These games are not set in stone twenty years in advance. Uh, most of these get scheduled in the off season or like at some point last year. The only things that were set in stone that we kn- knew about this year were LSU and Wichita State. And the LSU one, that's that can be debated on uh, when you schedule that. How much do you know about them? But they played in year one of Jerome Tang and Matt McMahon at their schools, and it was a competitive game, and you kind of felt like, okay, maybe that's going in the right direction. Uh, K-State went to Baton Rouge last year, manhandled LSU uh, days after finding out that Naquan Tomlin was off the team. Uh, and now they get the return game there. I, you're playing an SEC foe. I, I don't know what you want out of it. You, you scheduled with Wichita State. Uh, that was announced, what, f- f- uh, getting close to 
over four years ago now. Uh, and you started playing that in the, the 2021 season, or I guess it would have been 21, 22 season. And Wichita state has gone even further downhill there. Like you thought Greg Marshall was still going to be at Wichita state when you scheduled that thing. Uh, it's not K-State basketball, K-State athletics, or Bruce Weber's fault, and certainly not Jerome Tank's fault, that Greg Marshall made a lot of missteps, and it led to him being canned by Wichita State. Um, that's that's on Greg Marshall in Wichita State, not K-State. Uh, and I, I, think, I hope that we get news in the near future of the Wichita State series being extended. Now that both K-State and KU are playing them, neither of them should stop. This should be played every year. Um, I think it's just something that has to happen, and uh, it's it's been good for everybody, I think. Uh, but outside of that, you knew you were going to get a Big East opponent. I think K-State got one of the better matchups there in terms of you're going on the road, you're going to face a quality team with a lot of name and brand value with St. John's and Rick Pitino. Outside of that, you just got to take care of business. Uh, and Drake is one of those two where Drake was good last season. They played in the NCAA tournament, almost won a game, but this is where you could say you're kind of finagling things a little bit if you're you're Jerome Tang in K-State. Their coach, Darren DeVries, is now the head coach at West Virginia, and his son was one of the better players on that team, and he's now at West Virginia. So there's a lot that's kind of gone on there. Uh, with with those and that you laid it out perfectly the other teams on the schedule are just atrociously bad because uh, Cleveland State two years ago you would say well you know what their head coach Dennis Gates got a job at Missouri so like all these teams are in in a lot of flux they're not very good uh, I would even add like the just the one game that I think would make the schedule a little bit more appetizing and like it's not even like a crazy like big name but not having that cal game be in manhattan this year uh, yeah. i think kind of takes a little bit of the fun out of the non-conference schedule just because you'd be getting a power opponent instead of somebody in the the bottom 30 of ken palm so like it, it's not perfect but it's gonna have to do because th this is just kind of what we're what we're going to and that that's kind of sad because it takes some of the fun out of the non-conference matchups uh, because now you're seeing just a heavy reliance on conference play from the Big Ten, Big 12. Uh, eventually, I feel like every power conference is going to be playing 20 conference games, which is just going to kind of water down the non-conference. Yeah, here here is uh, here's Colorado's non-conference schedule this year, just an, another Big 12 comparison. Because uh, they are in the league this year. They were an NCAA tournament team last year. Uh, they should not be as good in all likelihood. Um, they will face Eastern Washington, Northern Colorado, Cal State Fullerton. Uh, shout out Max Jones. Uh, Harvard. They will go to the Maui Invitational, and then they'll face Pacific, who was god-awful last year. They'll face Colorado State. They'll face South Dakota State, Bellarmine. Uh, all teams that are very much like Bellarmine and South Dakota State. K-State saw last year uh, when they they played their non-conference schedule, and, and they ended up having them. decent years. Uh, Bellarmine, not as much, but South Dakota State did. Uh, and you'd assume that South Dakota State would take a big step back with Zeke Mayo now at KU. And, yeah. and again, even, even Colorado, from that perspective of like what we talked about with Iowa State getting to play Iowa, Colorado gets the added advantage of Colorado State being a pretty solid program where like K-State has this schedule with Wichita State and Wichita State's been down, but Colorado State's been on the come up. So Colorado even gets that advantage at the G5 or the mid-major level. Yeah, uh, here is the uh, just another comparison. Clemson, who was an NCAA tournament team last year, kind of in that bubble conversation, we know that the ACC – Loves to complain about, uh, you know, net manipulation. Uh, Clemson will face Charleston Southern, St. Francis, Eastern Kentucky, Boise State, Radford. They're playing in something called the Sunshine Slam, and their first opponent is Radford. So probably pretty comparable to uh, the situation K-State will be in. And then they'll face Kentucky in the ACC SEC Challenge, uh, which is, that's a great pull for Clemson. And then Memphis and South Carolina. So, uh Roughly same type of deal there for Clemson and how their schedule ends up looking this oh, upcoming year. So that, 
I'm just trying you to paint the these, picture uh, of of this thing being it's a countrywide thing in college basketball. It, K-State has a bad non-conference schedule in terms of if you're looking for fun or whatever else, but it's not bad relative to a lot of others because there are going to be a lot of others that look like this. And the hope would be is that Jerome Tang in year three now gets this program on some more steady footing to where they don't skip a beat the next couple of years and two, three years down the line, you're comfortable enough having a schedule like North Carolina, for example. Here's North Carolina's schedule this year. They will face Elon, Kansas, American, Hawaii. They'll play at Hawaii before they play in the Maui invite. Then they'll play Alabama in the ACC SEC Challenge, LaSalle, Florida, UCLA, and Campbell. So in that stretch there, they're going to end up playing uh, seven marquee opponents. You know, figure all three games in Maui unless they face Shamanad, but it may not even be Shamanad's year to be in it. Um, and some others in there. So Kansas, Alabama, Florida, UCLA. Uh, that That's something where you could start to get there in the future but you have to kind of get the steady footing. And I think that this, in a small way, is also still a little bit of a, a problem with uh, you know, Bruce Weber and the mess that he left for Jerome Tain to kind of clean up. But yes, tell me who is in uh, the Sunshine Slam or whatever the heck they're calling it uh, that Clemson is in. Uh, so it's Clemson. Penn State is... So they at least have another power conference opponent in this. Penn State San is worse Francisco. than the East State. I would agree. San Francisco is probably the second best team in the Sunshine Slam. Fordham, our boys at Chicago State. Uh, Drexel, IPFW, and Radford. Not good. Like that, that has another power conference opponent, but that tournament might be worse than the Paradise Jam. Yeah. Yeah. No, I think uh, I think you might be right on that one. So that that's I, that's just the the final thing. Like I'm trying to, I don't want to be too harsh on K State because they are a product of circumstance, and we'll have to see how this year plays out with the 20 team league schedule and everything. And others are doing it, so that should be pointed out. That should be known. Um, and you know, in addition to that, uh, they they are in a situation where if you go and look at another opponent that I would try and compare to like Creighton, for example, uh, Creighton is certainly in a very good spot right now. Program wise, you would think now they lose some guys from their tournament team last year, but, uh, they faced UTRGV, Fairleigh Dickinson, Houston, Christian, UMKC. They'll play also an in-state opponent. That's not in their conference. They will face Nebraska. Uh, they are going to play in the, the NIL tournament. Uh, that is going on this year where they'll face some good opponents, Oregon, and then their second game would be against either San Diego State or Texas A&M, and they'll face KU and Alabama and then UNLV. So in a lot of ways, uh, you know, they're a little bit elevated, but Creighton has been a consistent program under Greg McDermott for a long time now. And again, as much as K-State wants to be there and as, as fun as it was for people to kind of puff your chest out in year one under Jerome Tang, the reality of where the program is is, they are still trying to get that steady footing that I mentioned earlier. And they're close to it. They are very close to it, but they aren't there yet. And this is the year where, yep, it's a week schedule. Show up, beat everybody's ass, move on, and schedule tougher next year because you're built for it. And they should be because there are a good number of the transfers that they brought in this roster will be back next year. You won't have Coleman Hawkins. You won't have a chore or chore, but you will have Doug McDaniel. And you'll have a handful. You'll have you get an onion. So you'll have by fall. Uh, you'll have Brendan Hazen. Like you're going to have a lot of guys on next year's team that are on this year's team. And that has not happened at K-State for a few seasons now. No, I, I think that the next year's non-conference might look a little bit similar, but probably a few more power games mixed in, maybe even a, a, a little bit better of a tournament. Yeah, that the the MTE has to get better in a hurry for K State because it's honestly becoming a chore and a not very fun thing to watch. K State was in a fine one last year. Like people should recognize that they were in a fine one last year. Obviously, it didn't work out because everybody that was there turned out to perform much lesser than what they should have. Uh, like Providence was 
you know, honestly, one of the better teams to, to come out of there last year with the way things worked out. Uh, K-State, the same. Like, that Miami team, they went down hard at the end. And that's the other thing, too, that should be brought up. Jerome Tang and K-State, by the middle of the season and the end of the year, that schedule last year did not look good. But on paper last year, it wasn't that bad. But no. they were put in a circumstance where, like, they found out, okay, you could schedule difficult or think you put together a good schedule, and it could still end up being really bad for you. And it was last year. So what's the point of doing that versus just going up, scheduling bad with teams that you know that you should be able to beat, and then saying, we're going to let our conference play do the talking for us. And that's what they're doing here. Iowa State did it last year, and it worked out for them. Um, I think if K-State has Iowa State's non-conference schedule from last year, I think K-State's an NCAA tournament team. I, I, I think... They have more wins. It's not as tough as a non-con, and they would have had enough in Big 12 play to prove themselves and get in. So that's that's the final word on it, uh, mainly because I need to take my phone for my daughter. I think she's disabling it right now. Uh, so, yeah, we'll, we'll get out of here. If you want more on the K-State basketball schedule release and everything else going on, go to kstateonline.com, add on three. For Drew Galloway, I'm Mason Voth. We'll talk to you again on Monday.